Let's review some of the goals for our map data structures, and we'll use a simple array to try and achieve those goals. Okay, so uh, the get and put operations are, are used to access data. They're the primary operations on maps, and they, they happen often. Um, so our goal is to get access the, and updates with the get and the put to happen in order one time. And remember put, uh, both can be used to update data as well as to add new data to the data structure. Okay, so uh, how can we achieve that? Well, first of all, there's an observation that the get and put are uh, array-like. So we also saw that the semantics in some programming languages of, of using dictionaries or maps is actually uh, similar to array access notation. Um, so we can actually think of the, the key as acting like an index so uh, if we want the key to kind of act like an index and get this array-like behavior where we can access things in constant time, uh, which again with arrays, we can, we can do that with the index because they've got this random access property. Um, well, how can we do that? What, what is our uh, trick to achieving array-like behavior? Well, how about just use an array? But we already tried that, so, so why didn't it work? Why didn't the ordered array work that well? Uh, if you remember, we, we got reasonably good uh, access time. The get operation could be done in log n time, but the uh, adding items took a lot of effort. So the reason it didn't work very well um, is because we weren't using indices for access. We were keeping items in order, uh, but we weren't actually using the, the key to directly look up data. So as a little aside of, of what I mean by that, let's, let's think about a library example. So um, I used to work in a small library and small libraries often have several different sections for different styles of books. So for example, we had a children's fiction section and I'm only gonna really focus on fiction here. Um, we also had adult fiction and then there was also young adult fiction. Um, in addition to the adult fiction, there was also a mystery section, which was just mysteries as the name implies. Um, there was also another section for, full of just romance books. And then there was a, a set of shelves purely for new arrivals, which were usually things on the current bestseller list. Um, so we had all these different places where a fiction book could go. And sometimes it wasn't clear which one a particular book would belong in. For example, Agatha Christie is a well-known mystery author and uh, her novels could appear in either mysteries or possibly adult fiction. Uh, at the time, she wasn't writing anything new, so uh, it certainly not wasn't in new arrivals. Um, and there are plenty of examples like that. And there were other sections. There was also a science fiction section and a Western section um, and a couple of other places where, where books for special needs were put, like classic books that were commonly on the high school reading list, etc. Okay, um, so this library had an incredible head librarian. Uh, she'd worked at the library for eight or 10 years. She had an almost perfect memory of every book's location, where it belonged, because over the course of her career, she had uh, gone through all of the shelves many, many times. She had helped shelve books with us. Um, and oftentimes she was in charge of the purchasing books and deciding which particular section uh, a book belonged in. On top of that, in ways, she had a nearly photographic memory. Um, so, we could ask the librarian where a particular book was. Uh, so for example, we could tell her the author and the title of the book, and she would tell us incredible details like that it's got a blue cover, it's in the adult fiction section on the bottom shelf about three inches from the left. Okay, so the great thing about that was we didn't have to spend time looking the book up in the card catalog. We just had this, this fantastic resource, this oracle, this, this person we could ask who had almost instant knowledge of where everything belonged. And it wasn't just books. Uh, the um, head librarian also knew where other resources in the library were. For example, if you asked uh, about a particular report that was uh, submitted a month or so ago, um, they, she would maybe tell you that that report was in a stack of reports on the back of her desk about two inches down from the top. Okay, so what we'd really like is to leverage this sort of concept of to have, have some resource, if we had some resource that gave us this ability that um, if we had a key, we could quickly determine location of where that item belongs. Okay, and here by quick, we mean order one because uh, if this process of determining where something that belongs is uh, more than constant time, then our overall get or put of, of retrieving or putting the item away uh, will be more than constant time. 
And by location, I specifically mean index in an array. So our first approach here will be to just use a simple array. And for the time being, we'll assume that we have this ability, that given a key, we can determine its location. And we'll just look at some of the concerns that we run into. Um, and then in later units, we will talk about the process of actually uh, figuring out this location. OK, so let's use a simple array. Here, I have a simple array with 10 boxes, uh, indices 0 through 9. Uh, so currently, it's, it's empty. So we will go through a sequence of different operations. So uh, we will look at individual keys and their location. So uh, these will be puts. So we'll start off by uh, putting an orange. And we have some, some process that tells us that oranges belong in location 3. So we'll go ahead and put an orange in location 3. Uh, next, we will put a lemon, and uh, our process here tells us that for some reason lemons go in box 7. And then we will put a calendar. Uh, I guess calendars go in box 8 for some reason. Okay. Uh, so notice these aren't in alphabetical order. These aren't in any particular order. There's this, this process that just instantly looks at an item and uh, tells us exactly where it belongs. So uh, we're going to put a light bulb, and it belongs in box 1. Okay. And uh, let's go ahead and, oh, uh, baseballs apparently go in box zero. And uh, let's go ahead and add a couple more. Uh, so we'll put a bear in there, and bears apparently go in box four. And a uh, mouse goes in box six, so we'll go ahead and add a mouse in box six. And let's see, uh, oh, erasers go in box two, so we'll put an eraser in box two. Okay, and uh, oh, pencils go in box five. So we'll go ahead and put the pencil in box five. Okay, so we've done a whole sequence of put operations. Uh, now let's try get operation. So if I want to get something, I can say, hey, I, I want to get a bear. And uh, whatever this process is tells me, hey, if we've got a bear, it's going to be in box four. So I go out and I look in box four, and sure enough, there's a bear there. Okay, uh, now if I asked for something that wasn't in here, it may tell me to go to a box like nine that's empty. By the way, notice in my example that I've labeled these as uh, good puts and gets. We didn't really encounter any particular problems with this set of data. So we're going to do another example, and this time we'll encounter some problems. OK, this time we'll start over, but we'll encounter a particular problem that we need to be concerned about. So this will be kind of a counterexample, a bad example of things that can go wrong. Uh, so just like before, we'll uh, uh, do a sequence of puts. We'll put an orange in location 3, and then we'll put a lemon in location 7. Uh, and then we'll put a calendar in location 8. And again, the location is completely determined by whatever this process is that we'll come back to in a bit. Uh, and then a light bulb goes in 1. OK, imagine that at this point I want to go ahead and do a get. I want to retrieve something. And I say, hey, I, I'd like to get an orange. Where is that orange at? If I ask my, uh, my process here, and it's inconsistent, if it tells me, oh, an orange is in box 4, I'll go out and look in box 4. There's no orange there, and I'll assume it's not in my collection of data. OK, so that's one of our, our goals here, that we need consistency. If we ask for the same item or uh, items that we consider to be equivalent, we need to get a consistent answer. OK, let's do another example of a potential problem. So we'll do a, a sequence of uh, puts here. So again, we'll start with the key and the location. So I want to put an orange here. So uh, I, I ask my process here, and it says oranges belong in box 3. So you put the orange in box 3. Uh, then I want to put a lemon in here, and it tells me that a lemon belongs in box 7. Um, these are different from the, the previous examples, but that's okay. Um, as long as they're consistent over the course of the, the process that we're doing now. As long as uh, if I do a get, it will tell me that of a lemon, it'll tell me it's in box 7. As long as it's consistent, it's all okay. Um, okay, let's go ahead and put another item in. Let's go ahead and put a calendar in. Uh, oh, gosh, it tells me a calendar belongs in box Three. OK, so there's already something in box 3. So this is considered to be a collision when two items are assigned to the same location. Um, OK, there are different ways of handling this. We've got a simple array, so, so I, I can't put two things in the same box. Um, what we can do is we can use a process called open addressing. The basic idea of open addressing is that technically any location in the array could contain any data. If we encounter uh, collisions, we'll use some algorithmic process to figure out where we could put the item. 
So one approach to this is called linear probing. Basically, you start at where the collision occurred and just move forward until you find the first available empty spot. So in this case, it would put the calendar in four. Now, this is going to complicate the get process because now when our uh, process tells us a particular location to look at, we have to look at that location first, but then we may have to go through the same process of searching forward. So let's go ahead and add a few more items, then we'll do just a couple of gets. So let's go ahead and uh, add a light bulb. Oh, it tells us a light bulb belongs at box seven. Uh, again, there's a collision here. So I'm going to use my linear probing technique and move forward and put it in box eight. We'll put a baseball in box three. Oh no, another collision. In this case, the next box over is not empty. So I can't even put it there. So I have to move forward two spaces. Um, okay, let's do one more. Oh, we'll put a bear in box seven. Oh, seven's full, so we'll eight, nine. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, now let's think about the process of doing a get. If I want to get that bear, uh, I will start at box seven, but I'll have to search forward until I eventually find it. Um, and hypothetically, if the bear wasn't actually in the data structure, or like this, uh, I would start at box seven and I would search forward and I could stop if I hit an empty box. As long as I'm hitting pieces of data, I have to assume that the bear could be out there somewhere. But if I hit an empty box, uh, some sort of indicator that the, the box is no longer in use, um, I'll be able to assume it's, it's no longer in the data structure. Now, it's even a little bit more complicated than that if we start considering removes. Now we'll have to have a couple of different types of sentinel values. We'll have to be able to mark a box as completely unused, as in it was never used, versus a box that just had something removed from it. And they will have different implications for our search process. We'll be able to stop our uh, search, our linear probing, when we're searching for something if we hit an unused box. But if we hit a box where the data has been removed, we won't be able to stop our linear searching process. Okay. So you may have a sense now that in the worst case, eventually this array ends up being kind of full. And if we have lots of items assigned to the lo same location, we've basically got um, almost something equivalent to our uh, unordered list approach where we'll start at a particular location. Sometimes we'll, we'll probably be lucky and it'll be exactly the item we want. But in the worst case, we may actually have to search through our entire collection. Let's summarize some of the uh, findings from our simple array approach. So some observations. Uh, the key needs to be consistent. Uh, if our process tells us an orange belongs in box three, it always needs to tell us the, the an orange belongs in box three. Or at least it needs to be consistent with where the orange is actually at at the current instant. Um, Okay, uh, we also encountered this problem of collisions where multiple things get assigned to the same array location. Um, okay, so this caused some complications and the fewer times this happens, the better. Ideally, we would like every item assigned to a distinct location with no collisions whatsoever. But when we had collisions, we could resolve them by using this idea of an open addressing policy where basically every box in the array could technically contain every item. Uh, and as the array gets filled up, it's more and more likely, especially if a lot of collisions occur, that uh, items will not actually be in their proper location, the place that we first check. So we looked at a particular policy called linear probing, which is one of the easiest approaches to deal with uh, collisions in a simple array like this, where we just use the next available space, but it's some got some complications. And as this map starts filling up with data, it could uh, cause our time complexity to be order n, approximately, rather than uh, order one.